We are continuing our series, of course, on from devastation to restoration. How many are enjoying? Has it made some changes, some differences in your life already? At least on the way you're thinking about things, speaking about things, believing about things? You know, one of the things I think the overwhelming truth if you, that we've had over these eight weeks is that restoration is something that a child of God is entitled to. I don't care how devastated your life has been, what thing is, you know, and people, let's, let's be honest, there have been some devastating things that have happened to people in this church sitting right here before me this morning. But restoration is coming. I said restoration is coming. Hallelujah. So let's not take my word or my opinion. Let's remind ourselves what the Bible says about that. Of course, this was out of Proverbs 6 and verse 31. He says, people do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he's hungry. Verse 31, but when he's found, but when he's found, but when he's found, who? The thief. Who's the thief? <coughs> Who's the thief? <laughs> you can turn these speakers off here. Satan is the thief. When he's found, he must repay seven times what he stole. He must give all the property of his house, if necessary, to meet his fine. Hallelujah. This is not something I cooked up one night as I was eating pizza at midnight. Something that just sounds cool to draw people's attention. It's straight out of the Word of God. In other words, what I'm saying to you today is this is God's idea. This is not man's idea. This is not Pastor Chris's idea. This is not Pastor Jojo's idea. This is God. This is Christ who's risen from the grave that we just sang about. This is His idea. Amen? Anyone glad about that? (coughs) And since we know who the thief is, What does it say? He must repay what? Not one for one. Seven times what he stole. On my list of restoration items that I am declaring every day, I have the dollar amounts. The dollar amount that was stolen and the dollar amount times seven. After a while, it begins to add up pretty quickly. Amen? I'm pretty excited about that. Hallelujah. So what I want to start out this morning is looking at a key scripture. We've looked at it before in this church, but we're going to start a couple of verses ahead of where we looked at in the past. If you have your Bibles again, open to Acts chapter 3. Again, it's all, all about restoration here. This is Acts 3, verse 19. I'm reading out of the New Amplified. It says, so repent, change your inner self. Who is he writing this to? Is he writing it to unbelievers? He's writing to the church. What's the first thing he says? Repent. What does it mean to repent? Well, it means change your inner self, your old way of thinking, Regret your past sins and return to God and seek His purpose for your life. Why? So that your sins may be wiped away, blotted out, completely erased. Glory to God on that one. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day. Hallelujah. I love that right there. So the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day. Now, I want you to notice something about this scripture. This is not a one-time event in the life of a child of God. Refreshing can happen, or let me say it this way, refreshing should happen more than just one time. 
in our lives. Amen? And if you'll think back for a moment with me, it's not hard to identify the very first time of refreshing in your life. When do you think that was that occurred? The very first time of refreshing. When you asked Jesus into your heart. Hallelujah. The moment you made the Christ, the anointed one, and his anointing, the Lord and Savior of your life, there was a time of refreshing that came over you. <clears throat> And the good news was that from that moment on, then you became a candidate for times of refreshing. Hallelujah. <coughs> times of refreshing. And here's what I want to point out to you. How do these times come? How does a time of refreshing come? Well, he tells you in the previous uh, sentence. By repenting and spending time in the presence of the Lord. The more time you spend in the presence of the Lord, the more times of refreshing you can experience in your life. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. But see, just the opposite is true as well. If you're not spending time in the presence of the Lord, then you are not a candidate for times of refreshing. No wonder the enemy wants to do everything in his power to keep you out of of the presence of God in your life. If you ever wondered why, here is a big, big reason. The devil does not want you to be refreshed. He wants you to get so busy, so overburdened, so overloaded that you break down and you just finally quit. But here's what I want to encourage you today. No matter what the devil does or what, no matter what he's stolen, from you, no matter how much pressure you've been under, regardless of the circumstances you're facing in your life right now, do not get out from under the presence of God, because that's where times of refreshing will come. Hallelujah. So you have to put yourself in a position to receive from God. And again, remember, this is God's idea, not mine. We're reading the Bible, are we not? So let's read it again. So he says, repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Regret past sins. Return to God. Seek his purpose for your life so that your sins may be wiped away, blotted out, completely erased, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day. Now let's continue reading. Verse 20. And. See, he's not done now. There's something else that's going to happen once that happens, and that he may send to you Jesus the Christ, who has been appointed for you, whom heaven must keep until the time for the complete restoration of all things about which God promised through the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Hallelujah. If you have an Amplified Bible, I want you to underline that word retain. You don't just write it in there somewhere. The King James uses the phrase times of restitution. If you look up in the King James in the Greek, the times of restitution actually mean restoration. Restoration. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, what kind of restoration is this talking about? Well, he's talking about restoration on two different fronts. Okay? Number one, the restoration to a true theocracy. Does anybody know what a theocracy is? Hallelujah. Simplest terms, it's a government of the state by the immediate direction of God himself. No Democrats. No Republicans, no independents. God is in charge. A theocracy. That's number one. Hallelujah. Number two, he says there is going to be a restoration of the perfect state before the fall. What would that look like? 
without sin in this world. Hallelujah. That was the whole premise of my writing the book that the Lord had me write called God's Voice Activated Universe, Change Your Words, Change Your World. I was in prayer one day, one morning in our, in our living room. Uh, those of you who have been there know what our house looks like, but where we had the dining table, we actually had a, a couch that faced right into the fireplace there. I'm praying. I'm just believing God. I'm just waiting. I wasn't praying about anything in particular. I just, I'd just been praying in tongues. And the Lord spoke to me as clearly as I've ever heard him. And he said, it's time to bring back the Garden of Eden to the earth. I'm going, okay, that's wonderful. What does that mean? Well, over the years, of course, God is continuing to unveil that purpose. And not that I even have the fullness of it yet, but it's beginning to get more clear to us as a church. <clears throat> Hallelujah. But what's being said here is, is that heaven is not going to release Jesus until something takes place on this earth. Yeah. Hallelujah. God is all about timing. Yeah. Galatians 4, verse 4 says this, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman under the law. In other words, Jesus could not have come to the earth until the designated moment, until everything leading up to that moment had been completely and entirely fulfilled. And you should be getting pretty excited about this right here. Why? Because God is saying there are some certain events that must take place on this planet we call Earth before Jesus can make his second return or his second appearance for the catching away of the saints. Heaven is not going to release him until these events take place. Hallelujah. We know from the Word, uh, even Jesus doesn't know that time. Just the Father. But it tells us we can read the signs that tell us we're getting closer. Every day you wake up is one day closer to the return of the Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. For those who say, well, just bless Jesus. I just wish he'd come tonight. Well, according to the Word, heaven is retaining him. Why? Because there's a few more things that need to take place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me make this just as plain and simple as I can. Number one, God is saying, I'm not going to release my son until the times of restoration have been fulfilled. That's why I'm getting so excited about this series. Because if you are putting your faith on believing God for restoration of seven times what the enemy has stolen, I'm telling you, man, you are in you're, oh man, you're in for some good things. It's going to be exciting. I'm looking at, you know, just, just the dollar amounts that's been stolen from you. I'm looking at the people. I'm looking at the, uh, the influence. Uh, all these things that he's stolen from us over the years. Not only as a church, but personally. Hallelujah. I'm getting excited. But God is saying, I'm not going to release my son until times of restoration have been fulfilled. And number two, I'm going to restore everything I spoke through my prophets and that, through that what my prophets said that I would restore. Hallelujah. When I, when I first got started getting revelation on this scripture, oh man, I was just so, so excited. I could hardly contain myself. <clears throat> so the next thing that needs to happen is, well, when we begin to get a revelation of the scripture and it begins to you know, take hold of our heart, uh, we need to find out what the prophet said that God would do. Amen? What kind of restoration will he make? What will he restore? Because the word says he's going to restore everything the prophets of old said he would restore. Amen? Hallelujah. And I can't make this statement any more clear than I, than I will with this statement. The time of restoration, or a time of restoration, precedes the second coming of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I, and if you and I, if, like I, if you believe that it's close, then you have to believe that the times of restoration are even closer. Yes, Come on, somebody. Yes, Hallelujah. I submit to you today, we are smack dab in the beginning of God's restoration. Yes, Glory to God. And all you have to do, it's not that difficult, all you have to do is position yourself 
Put yourself in a place to receive it. Amen? Amen? So let me ask you a question. It's not a, it's not a rhetorical question by any means, but has the devil stolen anything from you, say, the last five years? I don't, we don't have to show hands. I know every, every hand in this room would go up. Has the devil stolen some things from you the last five years? Well, uh, do you want it back? How bad do you want it back? Well, then you've got to get yourself a position to get it back. Amen? According to the word of the, God, word of the Lord, word of God we just read, you are entitled to get back seven times what the enemy has stolen from you and your family. Hallelujah. Let that sink into your spirit for a moment. What would it look like if you received tomorrow morning seven times of everything that's been stolen in just the last five years? Think you'd be a little bit excited? I know my phone would be ringing off the hook. Pastor Chris, you're not going to believe it. Yes, I will. I will believe it. Amen. But here's, here's what I'm saying to you, too. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You're not limited to five years. Did you hear that? We're not limited to five years. I just picked that as a number. If you wait on the Lord and you pray about restoration in your life, maybe God will tell you, believe me for the last 10 years. Or believe me for 15 years. Or believe me for the last 20 years. Or whatever. The point is, it's never too late for it to happen no matter how long ago it was. Amen? You can believe God for a complete and total restoration in your life as far back as your personal faith will allow you to believe. The stronger your faith, the farther back you can believe God for. Man, I'm, I'm preaching better than you guys are amen in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want, believe God for everything the enemy has stolen from you. Just think for me, with me for a moment. Close your eyes. If God would begin to restore what the enemy has stolen from you over these years, what would your lifestyle begin to look like? What would you be able to do? What would you be able to accomplish? Where would you be able to go? I mean, you'd be able to do some amazing things for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. I want to share this scripture with you. The Lord had me share it. The Spirit spoke to me and had me share it last week during our worship time. But I think it's worth sharing again. This is in Joel chapter 2. Now again... We know Joel chapter 2 most uh, commonly in the church for uh, the part that was quoted in the book of Acts in chapter 2 uh, when uh, Paul's talking about, he says uh, that in the last days he said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prosper. Your, old men will, uh, your, your young men will dream vision. Your old men will, your, your old men will dream vision. Your young men will dream dreams and on and so forth. But there's something that came before that pouring out of the Spirit. And what was it? It was verse 25. And he says, I will restore or replace for you the years that the locust has eaten. The hopping locust, the stripping locust, and the crawling locust, my great army which I sent among you. In other words, he's saying, he's using an, anal an agricultural analogy of locusts coming in, destroying things. But he's saying, just the way these insects destroyed your crops, I am going to restore to you everything that's been stolen over the years. I will restore or replace for you the years that the locust has eaten. Verse 26, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord who has dealt wondrously with you and and here's what God is doing today. My people shall never be put to shame. My people shall never be put 
to shame. God's saying, I am going to compensate you for the years the devil has stolen from you. Whether it's finance, maybe it was a divorce, maybe bad relationships, disease, poverty, lack, whatever it is, doesn't matter. It's all, none of that's from God. God himself is saying, I am going to restore those years back to you. Hallelujah. Let me read it again. You shall eat in plenty, be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. That is a condition immediately following restoration. No shame. No shame. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Notice when God restores what the enemy has stolen, it says over these period of years, notice how your lifestyle changes immediately. He says, you shall eat in plenty. Understand this morning, plenty. Say plenty. Plenty is the nature of God. Hallelujah. And the good news is this is God's plan for you and me since the beginning of time. We have to understand today, folks, that as a child of God, lack or not enough or just enough never has been, never will be the plan of God for you and me. God has always, always, always intended for us to live in the land of more than enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you are dealing with shame today in any shape or form, never again will you experience shame because you have God's threefold promise right here. Number one, he said, I'm going to restore those years that were stolen from you. Number two, you're going to experience plenty. And number three, I'm going to deal wondrously with you. Hallelujah. Anybody receive that today? Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, we have to understand, shame takes on many forms. Probably some of the most powerful moves of the Spirit over the last 15 years that we've experienced uh, in our services uh, at Faith Life Felt have been when the Lord has directed us to deal with shame in people's lives. Man, it's so amazing to see people go free. <laughs> oh, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news. Whew, hallelujah. Shame takes on many forms. I'll just name a few. I mean, have you ever been under the shame of not being able to pay your bills? Or the shame of not being able to do for God what, what you want to, wanted to do or had a dream about? Hallelujah. I hate that. Maybe you've been in a church meeting where they need a certain amount of money to expand or maybe they need to buy some ground or maybe they need to build or purchase a building, whatever. That would be us today. Hallelujah. Your heart begins racing. You get thinking, wow, I wish I could be in a position to do something bigger than I've ever done before. Instead of giving that $50, I wish I could give $5,000 today. Instead of giving that $5,000, I wish I could give $20,000. Instead of giving $20,000, I wish I could give $50,000. Well, you got to start somewhere. Start believing God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Wouldn't that kind of giving be wonderful? Praise the Lord. How about the shame of being divorced? Or having children who are divorced? Or children who have been taken away? Or whatever. Hallelujah. There's numerous situations in the lives of people where the devil does everything he can to put shame on you. But the scripture that I just read said this, my people shall never be put to shame. Amen. Are you God's people today? Yes. Are you his child? Yes. Then this scripture is for you. Yes. My people shall never be put to shame. Maybe the shame in your part is not being able to do for your family what you'd like to do for them. Maybe it's not being able to give into other people's lives like you'd like to give. See, it, shame can come in many, many forms, but you have to understand none of it is ever from the enemy. It's all, I mean, from God. It's always from the enemy. Amen. The will of God for you today, the will of God for this church, the will of God for all of his children is that you never, 
no shame again. Let's read it one more time. Joel chapter 2. And I will restore or replace for you the years that the locust has eaten. The hopping locust, the stripping locust, the crawling locust, the great army I sent among you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Amen. Glory to God. How important is this to God? I'm telling you, it's very important because he repeats himself in the very next verse. And God repeats himself in the, in the next verse. There's something going on. Verse 27, and you shall know and understand and realize that I am in the midst of Israel. Uh, you can interpret that as the church in our, in our day and age. You can know and understand and realize I'm in the midst of the church and that I, the Lord your God, that I am your God and there is none else, my people shall never be put to shame. He says it two times in a one and a half verses, essentially. My people shall never be put to shame. Hallelujah. Do you think it, when God repeats himself that it must be important? I think so. Hallelujah. There's a lot of examples in this. Look at what God said to Joshua. How many are reading through the Bible? You've just read this as last week. Joshua 5, verse 9, The Lord said to Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. <clears throat> this day, say this day, have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Egypt, in the biggest sense, can be interprets any kind of shame that the enemy has put on you over the years. The word reproach actually means shame or derision, ridicule, disgrace. See, Egypt for the Israelites, it represented the land of not enough. The land Egypt today represents the land of not enough for a Christian. They lived, they had lived Enslaved, as slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. They were under the whip of bondage, never making enough brick, never having enough straw, never satisfying their taskmasters. It meant lack. It meant shame. It meant bondage. It meant derision. It meant ridicule. It meant disgrace. God said, I am going to roll all of that completely off of you. Hallelujah. Never again will you have to live in the land of not enough. Hallelujah. Here's a scripture that I pray very often for you, the church. It's a prayer that Paul prayed for the Colossian church. He said in Colossians 1 and verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints, God's holy people in the light. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and of the dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Glory to God. God has delivered us out of the land of bondage, out of the land of Egypt, he has put us in the land of promise. Yes. Hallelujah. But here's the thing. Even though you're now out of Egypt, you have to get Egypt out of you. Yes. I, won't have, I won't have anybody raise their hands. You have to get Egypt out of you. You can be in the land of milk and honey. You can be in the land of more than enough and still have a bondage mentality, a victim mentality, a poor me mentality. That's why renewing your mind every single day in the Word of God is so vital, so necessary, so needed to change out that stinking thinking. Once and for all, get the memory of Egypt completely out of your mind, out of your life. Hallelujah. We all have things in our past that the devil tries desperately 
to keep in front of us, to keep reminding you, sitting on your shoulder, speaking into your ear. Oh, remember when you did this. Remember when you said that. Remember when that happened. Remember when this happened. That, that discourages us and puts shame in our lives. But there's two scriptures that came to mind as I was putting this together. The first one was Hebrews 12 and 2. It says, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and to perfection. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize, that was you and me, folks, that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the what? The shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The actual Greek says, thinking nothing of the shame. Thinking nothing of the shame, he endured the cross and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And here's the good news. Because Jesus took the shame on the cross, you don't have to take it anymore. Today, you can go 100% completely free from shame. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we don't have this on the screen because the, the Passion Translation is not available in, in Isaiah, but it says this, Isaiah 61.7, that same passage I shared with you. He says, because you received a double dose of shame and dishonor, you will inherit a double portion of endless joy and everlasting bliss. Amen. Glory to God. A double portion of joy is a double portion of strength. Yes. When God restores what the enemy has stolen over the period of years, whatever it is for you, your lifestyle changes immediately, you begin to eat in plenty, and you have joy and plenty all around you. Understand, that is the nature of God. He is an overflowing God. Hallelujah. That's, that's been his plan since day one. Amen? Second scripture that came to mind during this was Philippians 3 and 13. Listen very carefully. He says, I do not consider, brethren, that I've captured and made it my own yet. But one thing I do. What is it, Paul? It's my one aspiration. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Amen. You can supernaturally, by the power of God, forget what lies behind you in your past. You have to understand that was the old you. That person is dead. That person is gone. That person is buried. You are a brand new species that never before existed. The new has come. The old has passed away. It's time to remove anything and everything that holds you back in your past. You can't change the past. And by definition, it is in the past. So move on with the blessings the Lord has in store for you. It is my one aspiration. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. See, you cannot drag your past along with you all the time, like having a chain hooked to a big suitcase or something. You're pulling along. You can't have it chained to you all the time and also expect to enter into the destiny that God has for you. They don't happen together. If you have a poverty mentality, it will actually limit the amount of restoration that God can bring to your life. Not that it's not his will. It is his will to restore everything completely. But you, you limit him with a poverty mentality. So that means you need to overcome that kind of thinking. And it takes time in the word. It ha you have to activate your faith by stepping out and maybe giving uh, and receiving in your life, whatever it is. A lot of people can really give. Some of them have trouble receiving. Other people can receive, but they can't give. 
But whatever it is, you have to take a stand against that and never let it come back again. Get right up in the devil's face this morning and tell him this. Poverty stops here. I am entitled to supernatural increase and restoration in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. It's all about getting that Egypt mentality out of your heart, out of your mind, and once you do, you then begin to experience restoration in every other area of your life. Amen. Glory to God. <clears throat> Today, it is time for all of us to develop a restoration mentality. Glory to God. Let's put the shame and the disgrace and the disappointment behind us once and for all and begin to step out into the amazing plan of God to restore our lives and live in the land of plenty. Hallelujah. In the land of plenty. Hallelujah. So this is what I felt the Lord would have us do. Jojo, come on up here. If you feel like that shame has taken your life in any shape, we're not going to ask you to tell us what it is or what. It's none of our business. But if you would like us to lay hands on you and pray and break that power of shame once and for all, then you need to come up front right now real quickly. Anybody here? 